from the perspective of an oil trader, I, I'm just so bullish Bitcoin based on the fact that like, if you were to tell me the world pumps 103 million barrels of oil every single day, starting next week, that number is going to be 51 and a half million barrels. I would be like out of my mind, like begging to buy every oil future off of anybody that would sell it to me, doing everything I could to get long. Bitcoin people are like, ah, eh, you know, like Bitcoin tends to go up after halvings. Like what the fuck? It fucking goes up 10x after every halving. Like this is to me, this is setting up for a crazy, crazy rally. The question is, has already happened, right? With with the halving. So no. yes, it, yes, people, yes, people get should probably get bullish because of the supply reduction. But the question is, has that already been front run? This episode is brought to you by Perennial Finance, the on-chain DeFi primitive redesigning derivatives for the DeFi native. You'll hear more about Perennial later in the show. Okay, welcome back to another 1000X podcast. We've had a lot happen in the last two weeks and I do have to say that it's sorry. sorry okay did you just get told to move yeah <laughs> <laughs> so for those who don't know uh we're recording this thousand x podcast well I'm in my usual location the studio uh, in London. Avi is in Saint-Tropez in a restaurant because there's no Wi-Fi anywhere in France. Correct. Or 9 a.m. except hotels. Is, we should we should honestly leave that part in just because it was so funny. I think he yeah. told me to get my feet off the table. He didn't tell me to move. Oh, dude, come on, have some respect for the French. Yeah. Anyway, um, it's like a, it's like a little uh, it's like a little small foot table. It's not a big table. It's, it's anyway. the table for, for handbags. It's like where women yeah. place their handbags, not where you put your feet. Look, Dude. I'm an American. What can I say? You know, there are a few times where being older actually like helps. And this is one of them. I could have coached you on that. Yeah, you, you definitely could have coached me on that. That's okay. Look, I needed to get comfortable so I could talk to the people about everything that they need to be talked to me about, you know? So, I mean, Bitcoin's it's, nuked. ETF flows have stopped. We're in a pretty dicey place geopolitically. Uh, what? Yeah, the, I mean, and ETH, ETH is ETH is nuking too. I mean, basically, ever since the so people like to always ascribe price action to news. Now, my view, which has been consistent, I think, over the last few podcasts, even when we were trading seventy k, is that it's very rare for Bitcoin to go sideways for this period of time in a bull market and not have broken through. Do you remember the last time we were trading around 70K? I was saying, guys, it's very rare that this type of price action happens. And then what immediately happened is we sold off 10% and then we went straight back up. And then I think people got a little bit more bullish based on that price action. But the reality is that that 70K level, 72K level has proven to be a very strong one. It's proven to be a lot of supply activation. And whenever you see a pattern like this after a 2x run up, I mean, come on. You got to last gotta, summer. We saw we saw it last summer during the um during the first phase of the bull market where the like prices kind of just stabilized for what was it? 4 months in the middle of the bull market. Like we were we were trading fuck, wait, let me pull it up here. We were trading what was the level? It was like 29k 30k for the better part of half a year and then we rocketed and i think this uh, something similar is going on here right you, you used a great phrase activation of supply so we hit all-time highs or, or thereabouts and long-term bitcoin holders including the u.s government start sending their coin to exchanges to sell um great take profit level everybody's in the money um, now we're getting hit with geopolitical headlines that I think are creating headwinds, which wouldn't have been there otherwise. Like, I think we would have broken through 70 K. I think we'd be trading 80 K right now, if it weren't for this Israel Iran stuff. And as an oil trader, I have some opinions on, on all of that, but you know, I think what we can't ignore about Bitcoin is that during crazy, crazy times, uh, where uncertainty is, is high and the world is going into, um, you know, uncharted waters, like with the Russia Ukraine war, as bullish as I like to be, Bitcoin objectively nukes first, right? Like it's, yeah. 
down with other disk assets like the S and P. This is my th- this is my just simple take, which differs a little bit. Ever since 2021, every time we've reached an all time high, we've actually puked shortly thereafter. We only make a five six percent gain on the previous all time high, and then we nuke. So if you look at 20 it, March and April of 2021, we got up to 60k. Then November of 21, we get up to 69. Now we get up to 74. I mean, basically, because of the type of market participant in this market, all-time highs tend to be a very good thing to sell, as opposed to previously, all-time highs are a very good thing to buy. So when you have a lot of retail in the market, those people tend to buy all-time highs. When you have a lot of you know, slower money, more institutional money, those people tend to sell all-time highs. Yeah. So I think what's happening is that we're just getting a dampening effect, which makes me think we're probably due for a pullback to 52K at this point. Uh, let's take geopolitic, like geopolitics out of it. I think if the Israel-Iran issue weren't present in our lives, I'd probably start bidding here. But it is. And so that adds a little bit more worry. I mean, we don't know what escalation could look like. What we're seeing right now is that there are reasonable reasons to believe that escalation will occur. And I know the oil market disagrees, but at least based on the information that's being reported in the press and based on what I know about Israeli politics, it's going to be very hard for there not to be a response. It's going to be very hard for for Israel to just take this line down. So from my perspective, that's a huge risk to the market. Uh, and I do think that it's good for Bitcoin in a, on a six month time period, but it's not so great for Bitcoin on a shorter time period, just purely because you've already had so much allocation hmm. and we're not really tracking gold anymore. Gold used to track Bitcoin, Bitcoin used to track gold. And now you don't, you don't really see that anymore. Yeah. They've disconnected for those who aren't paying attention. Gold is rocketing to all time highs. It's just well through them at this point. Uh, it's just up only. So Good here more is, more. yeah. So here's my take on all of this, uh, risk assets. And apparently Bitcoin and crypto is, is a risk asset. Now risk assets like the S and P crypto, um, that they're, they're telegraphing a big f- economic shock coming out of the middle East, right? They're, they're, going down pretty pretty quickly right now because of fears of escalation in this Israel-Iran conflict. Um, oil, on the other hand, is also going down, which is very unusual, right? Normally when geopolitical risk kicks off, um, the risk, you know, especially in the Middle East where a, an enormous percentage of the world's oil is pumped out of the ground, normally you would expect that a shortage of supply or a projected shortage of supply leads to higher oil. Oil is going down quite a lot. Everybody, everybody in the oil market is consensus, you know, max long and getting uh, rinsed right now. Why is that? Well, so let's talk about. It, it's easy to say, oh, Israel, Iran could create an economic shock that hurts risk assets and spikes the price of raw inputs like oil. But let's dig into it, like just a layer below. What what could actually create that shock? So let's say that Israel does something really extreme. Let's say they bomb Tehran, right? Let's say they just indiscriminately carpet bomb and level entire neighborhoods and diplomatic uh, and and like government buildings in the capital city. What then? What does that actually do? Well, Iran, like nothing, right? Iran's economy in and of itself is not a contributor to the world economy. It's not a real. It's not a factor in global GDP. No one's going to say, oh, shit, I can't do business with Iran anymore. They're already sanctioned up the wazoo. But that doesn't actually hurt earnings or anything. What that triggers is a fear of an Iranian response that will hurt the global economy. And Iran can do only one thing to hurt the global economy. They can shut the Strait of Hormuz, which is a choke point in the Arabian Gulf. Well, they call it the Persian Gulf because they're Persians, but the Saudis call it the Arabian Gulf. Anyway, 30% of the world's oil comes out of the Arabian Gulf into, you know, open open waters via this relatively narrow strait called the Strait of Hormuz, um, 30, 35%. Iran could shut that, right? They could just launch a bunch of cruise n- missiles at cargo ships that are going through there. And then suddenly you're looking at four or $500 oil and the econ- entire economy shuts down. So the way their lever to shut down the world is oil. And oil is telling you they're not going to do that. Because if they were to do that, 
if they were to even take out a single cargo with a cruise missile, um, every single major Western country uh, would start a kinetic war against Iran. That is not something that any country can stomach, is a quintupling or a 10xing of the price of the most important transportation fuel in the world. To quote Dune, right, the people who lead Iran, their plans are measured in centuries. I've read books about this. They're really, they're playing the long game. They don't want to force themselves into hiding or regime change or, you know, getting dragged out of a hole in the ground and hung in public like Saddam Hussein was over this, right? So I think Israel will respond. I think that Iran will probably try to avoid escalation because they want to stay in power and they're weaker than, than their nuclear uh, opponents. And frankly, the oil market is telling you just that. So th th is there a world, though, in which <clears throat> Israel and Iran do end up in a wider scale conflict, but oil prices don't aren't massively affected? Right. Impossible. Iran just keeps pumping. Israel obviously doesn't have access to really any 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 oil or doesn't have impact on the market. So is there a world in which, yes, there's a broader escalation? Let's say there is hits on bases, there's hits on direct territory in Iran, but Iran production doesn't go down. For example, if Israel is just hitting nuclear facilities or hitting military bases and Iran is retaliating against Israel and this goes on for a few months, but they don't close the Straits of Hormuz, right? Is that is that a possibility? I mean, if you see like a like Israel, the, the thing that all the security people are talking about is that Israel is going to take out Fordo, which is their nuclear facility, like drop some crazy bunker busters and get through. It's it's 100 <clears throat> meters underground, but they're like modern bombs that could do it. It's crazy. Like if that were to happen, if Israel were to take out Iran's nuclear capabilities and set them back 10 years, um, Iran would probably strike back at Israeli military bases and fail. So if Iran wants to just like, like if they if these two countries want to go tit for tat against each other's like military installations, Israel will dominate. Iran will not really be able to do much. And if Iran does manage to take out Israel's military capabilities to, in some respect, Israel will go back 10x because we know how they operate, right? And the, I, like it's impossible to see a scenario where this it's just main, remains somewhat contained. It either fizzles or it explodes. And if it explodes and these two countries are going after each other's population centers, then it's hard to see how oil doesn't get involved in, in, in the equation. I mean, even if even if Iran doesn't shut the Straits of Hormuz, right, they pump 3.1 million barrels a day out of the ground every single day. They consume 1.8 of those uh, domestically. So that leaves 1.3 million barrels per day that they're like you know, I use air quotes here, illegally exporting to the world. Um, it really is just India and China buying them uh, outside of the U.S. sanctions regime, which the Biden administration is effectively like allowing to happen. They're turning the, their back on it because they don't want gas prices to go up too much during an election year. So like that, yeah, that but, could but, come but, off the but, market. There's, there's no there's no unless the actual capabilities, unless the whatever the refineries are struck or the oil fields are struck, which may or may not occur. I would assume that the U.S. would be very against Israel Israel hitting those, and it doesn't really make too much sense for Israel to hit those in, in context. Yeah, Israel wouldn't want to hit um, their production because that would hurt. Israel is a consumer of hydrocarbons. They Exa wouldn't want to exactly. So, so they wouldn't they wouldn't want to actually encourage, encourage that. So they want they basically they want Iran to pump oil and not make nuclear weapons. So they would hit the right. nuclear stuff. Exactly. So basically, the way that I'm thinking about this is that that market of China and India isn't going to go away, right? There's no there, there's no reason reason for that demand to go away. And so, if we think that the supply is going to stay the same and the demand the, the demand is going to stay the same, even if a war breaks out, then the only way that they're going to actually hurt or have the price of oil impacted by this specific war is one, a gut reaction by the market to any attack by people that don't necessarily understand what's going on, which is kind of what happened with Russia, if you remember. Yeah. Like oil ripped and then nothing happened. Like well, that was real. Team. That was real. Yeah. Russia's like in, in a top three oil producer and but a not, top but two oil happened. exporter. Um, but... Because basically black, you know, uh, black market shipping took over the entire market. And yeah, now... it, took, it took a few months, though, like the world legit yeah. lost, you know, millions of barrels per day of, of export oil. Off I guess that's and that's why everything nuked. But like longer term, these fears 
and basically what's going on between Iran and Israel accentuate the need for alternative payment rails and alternative value movement rails as sanctions kick off. So long term, this geopolitical stuff, I think, is bullish Bitcoin. It could be bearish alts and other speculative like Web3 tech. Um, well, it's, de I, it's, definitely specu it's definitely for speculative tech. It's not good because it's just a yeah. risk off market at that point. Yeah. And you don't want a risk off market. No, you don't. Um, no, if, if you want, if you want things like Solana or Link to go up, you can't really have a risk off market. I mean, Bitcoin and even even Ethereum, right? But Bitcoin can, and it's possible that if sanctions get stepped up, so the EU is threatening even more sanctions against against Iran, uh, it's possible that we actually weaponize our financial system even at an even greater way over the coming six seven months. And that yeah. would be a very big boon for BTC. I mean, that would be as, as two people that don't necessarily support Iran, uh, you know, our bullishness on Bitcoin is probably helpful for Iran. But at the, at the end of the day, it's, it's a tech and you can't control it. This episode is brought to you by Perennial Finance. Perennial is quickly becoming one of the go to derivatives platforms and liquidity layers for all of DeFi. So let me tell you a little bit about them. There are kind of three things you need, right? When you're thinking about a place and a platform to trade on. First one, great trade execution. Second one, low fees. And third, of course, an on-chain permissionless platform. And Perennial nails all three of those buckets. With the launch of Perennial V2, they've made all of that possible by introducing a ton of new features, such as faster oracles, which reduce trade execution to seconds, lower fees, competing with major centralized exchanges and minimizing fees for both takers and makers. Fully modular markets, which allow the protocol to support any price feed out there. And fourth, cash settled, right? The trades are cash settled in USD, not in crypto. Perennial allows you, the trader, to gain access to deeper liquidity with only a fraction of the TVL. How it works is that Perennial enables a two-sided market made up of both traders and liquidity providers, right? Traders deposit the assets to get levered exposure, while liquidity providers providers provide these pools of capital to earn fees for taking the other side of the trader position. Perennial allows you to trade crypto, perps, FX, and coming soon, NFTs and more. Backed by some of the best investors in the industry, Perennial is a must check out platform if you're a crypto trader. Go check them out by clicking the link in the description. Give 1000x some credit. Go check out Perennial. You're going to love them. All right, let's get back to the show. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that geopolitical strife and increasing sort of like division and global trade, increasing barriers and problems and sanctions, all that's very long term bullish Bitcoin, which is, you know, stateless Internet money that can't be really hacked. Um, I think the other thing while we're talking about oil that's so bullish Bitcoin for the second half of this year is like everyone's ignoring the having. It happens in what, a couple of days, hours, I forget exactly. But like as of this recording, it's, it's imminent. And one thing that I, I want to say about that is from the perspective of an oil trader i i'm just so bullish bitcoin based on the fact that like if you were to tell me hey jonah uh the world pumps 103 million barrels of oil every single day to keep the human race moving starting next week that number is going to be 51 and a half million barrels because the uh, the the you know the other 51 and a half million barrels are just like they just disappeared like I would be, I would be like out of my mind, like begging to buy every oil future off of anybody that would sell it to me. Like I would be, I would be going crazy. I would be maxing out my, my VAR doing everything I could to get long. Bitcoin people are like, ah, eh, you know, like Bitcoin tends to go up after halvings. Like what the fuck? It fucking goes up 10 X after every halving. Like this is, to me, this is setting up for a crazy, crazy rally. The question I, I is, has already, the question is, has already happened, right? With, with the having so no yes it, yes people yes people get should probably get bullish because of the supply reduction but the question is has that already been front run and the the, the bitcoin having is the most telegraphed event in the entire world for you to tell me that people are going to start buying the day after right i mean there has to be some level that the market is able to price in the fact that they know exactly four years in advance when the supply is going to come offline right Th there has to be there has to be some acknowledgement that the market is at least moderately efficient. So the real the real question is, um, what is what what does this look like? Because what you have now is you have a slightly different you have, you have a slightly different dynamic. You have these you have the outflows from the miners, 
that are going to be cut that are basically going to be cut in half but you also had these offsetting inflows inflows from the etf right and so if at the same time you have this supply reduction for the miners but the inflows from the etf are now down by 50 percent then it doesn't actually you you've you've netted out to nothing yeah so my my view is that inflows into this asset class are what's going to drive it more than anything else and the supply reduction while helpful doesn't matter unless we continue to get these these large these large inflows and these inflows seem to have stopped the supply is reduction I isn't in so okay let's be clear about two things here i i agree with you on on the fact that flows matter i think that a supply reduction is a form of inflow and the etf flows have stopped you are right about that i agree there so kind of kind of i mean it, it depends right so supply reduction is is a partial inflow how is it a partial inflow well miners don't sell 100 percent of every btc that they mine. Yeah. so let's say they get their they get their income cut by half that doesn't necessarily equate to that level of inflow what it equates to is whatever percent of bitcoin that they sell every time they get that they get that income that that counts as inflow right yeah so if they sell only 50 percent, then you're actually getting a 25 percent Okay, so let's let's assume they only sell half their Bitcoin. It's mm -hmm. three and an eighth of a is the new BTC reward per block. So three and an eighth BTC per block times four blocks an hour times twenty four uh, hours a day times the price of Bitcoin, which is sixty thousand dollars. That gets us to something like eighteen twenty million, fifteen twenty million dollars a day worth of Bitcoin mined. So let's just say that seven to 10 a day get sold. Okay, so you're right, like $10 million a day uh, is it's not really meaningful flow for now, but into perpetuity, it adds up. Meanwhile, the ETF flows have stopped for now, but they have not stopped into perpetuity, right? So um, in the short run, it's it's not helpful. So maybe maybe the conclusion is that the halving isn't going to create a short term rip. But over the long run, like there isn't enough capital in Bitcoin right now or in the space to front run that amount of supply loss forever yeah look my my view on this is that the numbers that you mentioned are just too small to matter for the for the hat so yes over the long run what it does is it makes bitcoin a more attractive asset to buy but it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to 80k any anytime soon it doesn't mean we're going to 100k anytime soon because it, it's not it's not going to be a main driver of this now, what I think the, the way to make money on this specific narrative, I think, is that it brings attention to Bitcoin and the Bitcoin ecosystem. And so you have all of these different things that are building on Bitcoin now that I, th I think people should start to start to pay attention to. Basically, any any of the NFTs that are built on BTC, any projects that, that are being built on, uh, on on BTC, those are probably going to get an increased amount of attention because of the having and therefore are probably good buys. So like the, you know, the, the Bitcoin monkey NFTs yeah. probably, probably do well. Ups, um, the yeah. meme coin. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I don't necessarily know if I agree with that because, and again, I, I don't have a nuanced take on this. I just, I don't think that Bitcoin is an L1 that's designed or optimized for like a good user experience for anything except Bitcoin. Right. So um, I'm not sure that there will be this like vibrant ecosystem of stuff that thrives on Bitcoin that because it's it's a so narrative just, token. Just to, just to be explicitly clear, I don't think that this is going to be a long term play. Mm. I think this is a you get in it two weeks later, you're out. OK, no, no, that that I agree with um, that that I completely agree with. So we agree there. I guess you did mention attention, which is an important segue into kind of like w like what what you know we we've we've taken some heat on the podcast for basically focusing on bitcoin and on meme coins which is this barbell trade um you know because in in effect that kind of ignores a lot of the innovation and technology development that's going on in the middle of the barbell with you know web3 apps and decentralized finance dpin all this other stuff um however like attention is really on bitcoin and memes and that's that's where the returns are right now. Like, you know, governance tokens and all the complicated stuff in the middle of the barbell, it's it's not really performing 
but you know th this could be a buying opportunity so bo both you and i kind of tweeted like hey crypto twitter what should we be talking about what should we be paying attention to um you know maybe we get to that later in the podcast but like why avi right now why is all the attention on the memes and what memes are you you focusing on and why is nothing else performing so what's kind of interesting is that the the memes the memes that are doing well are just are just the low caps uh right now um and the ones that are new and have sort of broken through like mute i don't know if you guys you, you guys have seen i guess although mute mu is down 25 percent today but it was doing it was doing well before <laughs> i think uh i i think what's happening is that obviously if you had the barbell strategy you did very well on the way up and you do very poorly on the way down which is why i think it's very important if you're trading and operating in the meme coin space you you, you have to just take profits uh, at, at when any, when anything crazy happens, you have to take profits. I mean, yes, we've all heard the stories of the people turning the ten dollars into thirty million, but the reality is it's probably not going to be you. And the best way to do this is to scale out uh, of of meme coins. Basically, once if you if you get into meme coin and it hits a hundred million, you just start. Out. I think that's just generally yeah. uh, gen generally the case because it, it's very difficult to actually generate an edge on these things. Um, I think there are very specific cases where maybe you can. So, for example, I think that Jonah, you actually did generate some edge on Bowden, and you played that very well. But I think, I think, I think in general, what you were, what we're trying to, what we're trying to do right now, is the whole market has just been trying to pump meme coins, pump meme coins left and right, and we're going to find out over the next three months which ones have staying power and which ones don't. And the ones that have staying power are probably the ones that have a lasting brand. The ones yeah. that will always be will will have something that will always be appealing to a certain group of people at any moment that are not just flash in the pan type things. Right. Yeah. I mean, like the way I see it uh, is that, you know, first of all, let me just say that I am not optimized for meme investing. I, I've spent 20 years in TradFi and I'm, you know, to, to me, I would have never have invested in a meme coin until recently when it kind of clicked for me uh, with Bowdoin. But like, I think, I think the deal with memes and the reason why they're garnering so much attention and generating such spectacular returns. And, and frankly, they are, some of them, the, the benchmark memes of this cycle are outperforming alts during this sell-off quite meaningfully, right? Like that deserves attention as well. Um, not not the shitty ones that no one cares about, but like the, your whiffs and Bowdens of the world, like they're definitely outperforming a lot of altcoins. Um, I think the reason why is that like if you're going to invest in a token, right? Bitcoin is digital gold. It's internet money. ETH, there's a real narrative there. Solana, there's a real narrative there. So the L1s, like benchmark L1s have their, their role. Um, but out the risk curve, like, why would you want to invest in a governance token that gives you a vote in some DAO you don't care about or that doesn't really accrue earnings of a Web3 protocol that's kind of a business and kind of not when you could invest in something that is literally just an attention token at a, at a low valuation when when you think it's going to go up? It's kind of like investing in the Nike swoosh uh, as, you know, if you're one of the first people to discover it. Right. And to me, like. I think that gambling, like the casino meme experience uh, is so much better than anything that Las Vegas offers that, you know, it, it will eat into that gambling market uh, or create new gambling markets that didn't exist before. And meanwhile, like gambling on tokens that that are linked like very loosely to Web3 businesses that, you know, may be gaining traction like that's that's less fun to gamble on and you can't value it in a, in a, like with, with a DCF model, especially during a sell-off. So like, I, I still, I still believe in the barbell strategy. And I think that it's, you, you want to wait to buy the middle of the barbell, wait to buy some of these alts. Cause I think they're going to go a lot lower. However, with memes, you know, I'm not, not financial advice, nothing, nothing crazy here. Do your own research. This is, you know, this is gambling that we're talking about here. It's not investing. Don't, you know, don't take any of this as, as a, a reason to buy something. But like, I, I do believe that if you have a reasonable expectation that attention will be directed towards your meme, um, relative to the, you know, valuation dependent, it makes sense to buy. Bowdoin is one of those things. Like for me, I, I think that people will increasingly focus on this guy's age 
and his you know inability to deliver uh, coherent speeches, which is like basically job number one of a leader, especially the leader of the free world. Um, I think that it, it plays into like embarrassment about the state of America, embarrassment about this, the age of global leadership. Like I think as attention focuses on that meme, which kind of captures the zeitgeist of our era, people will buy the token for a laugh. Equally, like there, are, you know, that, that meme's valued, what, four or 500 million, 300 million, something like that. You know, that you can, if you're going to speculate on a meme, uh, it also pays to pay attention to things like under $10 million. Like I, I recently saw dollar sign Jew, you know, you and I are two Jews who podcast about crypto, crypt, crypto and Jews are memetic things right now. They, they get a lot of attention on Twitter. Why not? Right. Um, these are all things that, these are all things that I think yeah. work, <laughs> you know, I, I, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. 100%. The dollar sign Jew, uh, you know, you know, I'm in that with you. We, we talked about it earlier, but it's just, it's just funny because I would have expected there to be a much larger Jew coin in the past, but the fact that there wasn't kind of just, kind of just cracked me up because like I pointed out, Jews are a very mimetic force in general. Yeah, I, I think that throughout human history, they've been a mind virus and people just can't stop thinking about them. It's kind of crazy. Like at any given moment, people will just blame the Jews for things like stubbing their toe or weather or global world conspiracies or, you know, siphoning off money from the banking system. I mean, it's just like it's it's honestly un, like unbelievable the amount of things like Jews are basically a Rorschach test to individuals. <laughs> so I think that. <laughs> you can see whatever the hell you want to see, which makes it a pretty powerful meme. I don't think this coin is ever going to get listed on an exchange. Uh, you know, Joe Bowden might, but it's still uh, it's still kind of a funny, a funny little thing that they got going on there. But yeah, I think when it comes when it comes to meme coins, it's what has everlasting potential. What in if you can imagine this thing in ten years, are people still going to care? Which is why you know I did sell most of my Zin. Because I don't know if people are going to care about Zen in five years. In fact, they're probably not. But are people going to care about cats and dogs? And, you know, are people going to remember the, the days of Joe Bowden? Yeah, people are going to remember the days of Joe Biden in five years. Yeah, I agree. Especially if he, you know, if he wins again. So, um, if he doesn't win, that's a, a very bullish catalyst for crypto. Uh, crypto is currently trading like he's going to win, and you know, it's it's amazing. So going back to our our topic of doing some research on a few projects that are in the middle of the bell, you know, the barbell, um, and just educating ourselves on Web three and DeFi. Um, I was amazed when I was browsing through some of these protocols, just how difficult it is to access if you're a US or a UK user. You know, like. The regulation is is really a massive lid on the price of crypto. Like I guess the three the three coins uh, three projects that came up the most in our Twitter call out it was Ondo, Athena, and Hyperliquid, and like you just can't touch that stuff if you're in America. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's it's really it's really sad, honestly. I mean, once once that gets solved, I mean these types of assets can go up a ton because I think one thing that we've proven is that the US bid matters more than anything else. And the only yeah. types of people that are really able to use this easily are people are people offshore. I mean, obviously, I think people probably in the US use VPNs. Obviously, I don't. But, you know, I think you, if, if you were to dig into it, you'd probably find you'd, you'd probably find that's what people what people are doing. I also think that, you know, things like things like Ondo make a lot of sense in terms of where the future of crypto is going yeah we all agree that tokenization is a future we all agree that what what we need to have is we need to have more assets represented natively and on chain from from the beginning and ondo and ondo is doing that and they genuinely are building some pretty cool financial infrastructure i think that they're going to face a lot of pressure out of the united states unless they can get all of the big institutions on board because obviously they're very dangerous for these guys but they're they are a good product right they're a good product they're going to make money um you know it's just it's a very it's a very simple 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 way to make money they just have to start expanding their expanding their offerings i mean as yeah. as i 
browsed these three protocols and just dug into the docs and tried to learn about them. I think Ondo was the most exciting to me um, uh, of the Ondo Athena Hyperliquid trio that we got recommended. Uh, to me, like, what? so what does Ondo do? Basically, they turn, right now, they turn short-term US treasury notes into tokenized form, right? And you can't touch that if you're in, if you're in the United States, mm -hmm. but like the silver lining here is if you live in America, you can just go open a brokerage account and buy some T-bills and you're good. You don't need this stuff. Meanwhile, if you live in Argentina and you want US stable coin yield, you can't really do that. You can't really buy T-bills easily if you're retail in some, you know, developing country. So Ondo provides that solution. It basically allows you to own a dollar. It's it's like tether, but with yield, with with actual high savings account yield. And I think that's brilliant. And obviously that's that's just the, the first step along a long journey. Eventually, you know, it'll be tokenized S P uh for you know people in Africa or tokenized <clears throat> you know to tokenized uh hedge funds or tokenized whatever like i think ondo has tremendous potential i'm very excited about it the ondo token clearly these guys just did it because they they need a way to monetize their their efforts and like i don't believe in the ondo token i don't think you need the ondo token i think that ondo should make money the way tether makes money by like shaving shaving a few bips off the top uh this is why i don't believe in token investing in these projects because these tokens are meme coins effectively they offer nothing other than a uh, kind of like attention and you can do better with other meme coins or probably do better with Bitcoin. So I don't believe in the Ondo token. I believe deeply in, in the Ondo offering. Yeah, I look, I, I can't really say whether I believe in the Ondo token or not, because I think it really just depends at the end of the day on securities laws and what they're able to do with that token. If this if this token just ends up being a way to distribute profits among Oh, then it, then I believe in it. Then yeah. then obviously then obviously this thing this thing has value. I'm I mean it that's right now it's not, just a governance token. That's not it today, and therefore it doesn't really make a ton of sense. But in the future, what I'm hopeful for once we get rid of Mr. Gensler, that we find out we find some frameworks where we can take these good products like Ondo and have a token that actually you know, has value associated with it from the cash flows from the cash flows of this platform. I mean, think about it. It doesn't make sense if let's say one day Ondo wants to go public, why would they ever go public by issuing actual stock? Why wouldn't they just issue a token that they can direct cash flows to? It just makes so much more sense based on their whole platform, based on the 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 premise that they're trying to bring in everybody into crypto, right? And so at some point they're going to have a token. Let's say they get big enough because they, they they go public in a world, let's say in a world where they didn't have a token today, at some point in the future, they're going to have, they're going to need to have a token. So they're going to need to figure out how to generate value for those, for those token holders. And the only answer really is that they need to, they, they need to pass back some, some of the cash that they, some of the cash that they generate. I think you hit the nail on the head. If, if securities laws change and you can issue a token, that allows you to pass cash flows from your real business through to token holders, then Ondo is probably the token you want to hold. Um, you know, the D DeFi tokens will just like literally be limit up. Um, but yeah, until then, and that's a long journey until then, man, I think you're going to get spectacular outperformance from Bitcoin or the memes. Um, Cause it is like, People people got excited about a, a governance vote during the 2021 cycle, and then they just immolated value on those tokens. So I ugh, I don't think people give a fuck this time about governance uh, tokens. The the other two projects weren't particularly let, let's put it like this: they weren't particularly exciting to me. I mean, Hyperliquid is just an exchange. Like I don't see how it differs from all of the other exchanges that have ever been launched. It. it you know, yeah, I didn't get it either. Like, I I thought it was a really slick user experience. Yeah, it's and good. By the way, it's good. I mean, I, I I really like it. It's just not. It doesn't it's, get it's me built on a Cosmos like the the day, app chain. Yeah, it's like, but it's like, why DYDX is already doing that? Like, I don't understand the differentiation. So Hyperliquid was a bit. I mean, even though that was mentioned a ton, maybe somebody in the comments can explain to me why people love this thing. Maybe is it because they have a good referral program and people are trying to <laughs> refer us to it? But I don't know. And then Athena, Athena is interesting only because it's the first example of a perpetual stable, 
you know, a, a perps based stable coin that's actually managed to take off. I mean, this idea has been around forever. Back in the BitMEX days in 2019, people would just consistently, if they wanted to go to cash, they would just short the one expert, they would just short the perpetual future against their Bitcoin balance because you actually couldn't hold USDC or USDT on BitMEX. You could only hold BTC. They only accepted BTC. And so the only way to go to cash would be to actually short the perpetual and you would generate some sort of yield. So basically anyone that's been trading in this world for more than a year hopefully knows that they can do this. And there have been a bunch of different projects that came out uh, in the past on Solana, mostly where this was attempted. But Athena seems to be the only one where where it's really taken off. And it just seems to be because of the names, the names behind it. I think that the biggest issue with all of these products at the end of the day is always going to be their collateral management. And if they can work with exchanges to say, hey, we, we need a non-liquidatable account, then perhaps this can this can take off. But other than that, it's it's a it's a centralized product, obviously, because there has to be some like there there has to be some access to these perpetual products. Maybe in the future it'll all be decentralized, but um Yeah, I mean I, I was reading their through their docs and I do I think I came into it very bullish on the project and after doing my research, I feel very uncomfortable with it for a couple of reasons. The first is that they build themselves as the world's first sort of like fully decentralized uh, stable coin that and that's what, you know, Internet money needs is this. It's it's very centralized. They, if you dig into their docs, they're like we have a 24 seven team of people with experience from places like Tower, DRW, Jump, Jane, like managing the, the system and, and watching for liquidations. Um, also, they're taking an ass load of exchange risk, like if Binance and OKX get in trouble, like it, your your USDE is just gone right now. Another problem is that they're short, they're short gamma effectively. So like, yes, in a raging bull market, you earn decent yield on USDE. Uh, just like in a raging bull market, you could earn 100% APY loaning out your stables and ETH on FTX uh, when when that was a feature that that Sam created. But like. What in a, in a bear market, what happens? The first thing that happens is the collateral, which is, which in this case is steeth, staked ETH. Like staked ETH will depeg versus ETH. Like I think it got as low as ninety two cents on the dollar during the last bear market. So that happens at the same time as perp funding goes like wildly negative. And so if you have like ten billion locked in Athena, earning bull market, you know, like lazy yield. And then funding goes negative at the same time as the collateral depegs for whatever reason. Um, this this portfolio just gets like liquidated like crazy. Steeth is not high quality collateral. ETH is high quality collateral. So ultimately, like one thing I started my career in credit trading. One thing you learn if the yield is too high, like there's a catch. And to me, I think that this is just one of those lazy places to earn yield, like Anchor Protocol was before the, the music just stops. This is not decentralized. You're taking a tremendous amount of exchange risk. And if you price in like the, <clears throat> yes, okay, there's a custodian, it's copper, right? But like if you price in Binance rug risk and the impact on collateral and your ability to get your money out, um, I, I don't think the, that the yields you're collecting compensate you for the risk that you're taking. Yep, I think you nailed everything actually. I don't really even have any, any anything to add to that. That was that was effectively my reaction to every one of these projects before. And this one is even worse because it's so large now. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and the bigger the bigger it is, the worse it the worse the problem becomes in time in times of stress. And so yeah, is 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 this going to be the next Luna? Probably not, because I don't think it's gonna have systemic impact. But is it going to blow up? You know, I think given given enough time, if they get large enough, the answer is yes. There's actually something interesting about Luna, right? If Luna hadn't grown as much as it did, it wouldn't have taken down the industry and it would probably never have blown up. So if they had just capped themselves at issuing, you know, five billion uh, of their stable coin, they probably would have never blown up. But 20 billion was just too much. Yeah, and Athena is going to go the same way. If they stay, you know, in you know, manageably sized, they're going to be fine. But if twenty billion dollars worth of value is in there, earning twenty percent, that it, it's like 
if if lots of people bid up a shitty junk bond, the yield goes down, right? And if lots of people put their money in this thing, the yield will go down because that's just more perp selling. So the basis will collapse, stay closer to flat instead of like trend, you know, always being a little bit positive, it'll be, you know, kind of like marginally negative, the yield will go away. And then there's rug risk when, when, uh, if Steve depegs during a crazy, you know, crypto rinse, which almost feels inevitable to me at some point. So if I were, if I were looking to earn yield, and, and I do earn yield this way. I, I just stake my ETH on Lido. Like I, I think that a decentralized solution is better than, you know, sort of like centralized points of failure. Also, who knows how copper is going to perform during during a, a real stress test? Like they haven't been through one yet. Yeah, I agree. Agree with all points. Although I, on, on on copper, the the only stress test is just their their relationship to Binance. But uh, everything everything is held off exchange on copper, and so copper is just not exposed. They could get into a lawsuit, but there's no actual mechanism to take those assets, as far as I understand it. Well, that's that's the risk is the lawsuit, like a 2021 style um, Binance, like FTX style, uh, you know, disappearance of like if Binance if Binance dies the way FTX died. Right. Copper's assets are safe, right? Assets within copper are safe. But no crisis is the same as the previous crisis. I think, you know, it, what could happen is Bitcoin runs up to a million dollars a token and then the United States just says, uh, you know, sorry, copper, that's that's our Bitcoin now, right? <laughs> it's it's legal yeah. risk, you know, not your keys, not your crypto, right? So ultimately, I, uh, I question this. It's a shame, honestly. So out of the three projects that we looked at, we'll do another three next next episode uh, that we'll that we'll review. But out of the three projects that we looked at, Ondo definitely the most interesting. Yeah, like Ondo aligns with my sort of like understanding of Web three at this point, which is financial tools and banking and access for developing countries. It is this is not a U.S. developed market product, crypto. So Ondo providing these things, like it's okay if U.S. users can't get tokenized 5% yield on Ondo. US users can get that, you know, by having USDC on Coinbase and frankly they don't need it anyway, right? It's people literally everywhere else that that need this stuff. And I think Ondo is actually doing a great job uh bringing bringing, you know, ba banking and uh brokerage to the masses of people who JP Morgan and Bank of America and Schwab and Fidelity won't provide it to. That makes sense. Jona as Great always, speaking to you. was a pleasure. Go have a go have a coffee and a croissant at Senequier or Cafe Dior. You're living oh. uh, La Dolce Vita out there. Yeah, it's, it's not as sweet as you might think, but it is. Uh, it ain't bad. Um, All right. Have a blast, man. Great talking to you. Thank you, as always. Excellent. It's a pleasure.